Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Q2 WellSense podcast. I'm Stuart Skolton. With me today, my partner, Brian Jarosinski. Excited to be back with us. I know a lot of you have been part of the show before. You've seen kind of how we, we run things in terms of the dialogue that we have, the market reviews, the updates. We're excited to be back with you. We've got a great show planned today. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items. You'll notice that uh, everyone is muted right now. And uh, like we uh, have said in the past, we love dogs and kids. We just don't want to hear them on the podcast today. So if you're muted, please stay muted, but we'll stop periodically. Feel free to uh, ask us questions as we dive in here. And uh, we're excited to be with you. Brian, you want to say a few words before we uh, kick off the show? Yeah, thanks, Stu. As always, um, you know, in, in previous quarters, thanks, everyone, for your, for your valuable time and joining. Um, you know, we, we really enjoy doing these, you know, help getting you guys updated information with what's going on in the financial world some good information you might be able to take back and use to your advantage, uh, certainly in an unbiased manner versus what you're going to see on TV these days. You know, there's always typically an, an agenda there. Um, so we're just looking forward to it. We got, we got a whole bunch of uh, topic items that we're going to talk through today. And uh, as always, uh, per Stu, when he said, I mean, the, the chat will remain open. So again, we kind of run this Joe Rogan podcast style, right? It minus, you know, if you guys have questions, just pop them in the chat. And, you know, we'd love to eventually probably jettison from going over this uh, valuable information we're going to share with you to just taking your Q&A. And then as always, anyone who wants to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Stuart or myself, um, just let us know. And we'll, you know, we can certainly go into your specific situation more so after the call's over. Yeah. And I, I think it's worth mentioning as well, for those of you that maybe are new to WellSense as a program, uh, WellSense is a financial wellness service that's really offered to you through your employer. Uh, it allows you the opportunity to engage with our team of advisors to help you with that individual financial planning conversation. So whether you're reaching out to Brian or myself, or maybe keeping an eye out for emails and different campaigns that go out um, through your organization, there's opportunities to engage with individuals, get some guidance, um, whether it's just a financial checkup, maybe you want to make sure you're making a good financial decision, or uh, maybe you're going to make a big purchase and you want to talk through it. That's really what we're here for and the WellSense team more broadly speaking. So um, excited to be with everybody. As, as I've said, we uh, wanted to start with a, a little bit of a market outlook. Obviously, there's a lot happening in the market. It feels like we're constantly exposed to all this information, you know, more so than than in the past. And so how do we, you know, really disseminate and discern what we should be focused on and maybe what's just the white noise that the, that the talking heads might be uh, trying to uh, to get our attention on? So I don't know, Brian, do we want to maybe unpack some of the things that are going on today? Well, so most people here, I mean, again, most of you guys are coming to us from our 401k plans that we manage around the country for you, right? And obviously, most of you, I would assume by now, have probably gotten your first quarter statements. And it's, I would assume with most of you, like myself, it's nice to see a positive number on, on those statements for the first time in the, in, in the last couple of quarters. Last year, obviously, was a tougher year in the market. Um, you know, we all know negative news sells. So that's normally what the media companies are going to put on, you know, CNBC, Fox News, whatever you're watching. Um, but, you know, at least we had some positive returns, right? So the, the big thing in the first quarter, as you guys have seen, was the, was the banking issues, right? We had an issue with Credit Suisse and, you know, UBS, you know, ended up buying them up. Obviously, F SVB Bank out of uh, Silicon Valley, that was a, that was a biggie. Um, what was the other name? Signature Bank. So we had some banking issues. And, uh, some people always ask, well, Brian, why did that happen? Ultimately, right, a bank's job is to collect assets, right? And then once they collect the assets, they're obviously trying to invest and make money in various places. And what a lot of these banks didn't well do on management is they were buying a lot of treasuries and things that were paying lower interest rates. And when their interest rates skyrocketed now almost a thousand percent in the last year, you could get better rates at other banks. So people were kind of bank bank hopping around, which we'll talk later today about really making sure you have good cash management. Um, but that's really what we saw a lot of it was, was the banking issues. Um, we've actually seen pretty good earnings. Um, this is a big week for earnings if you guys follow it. But I mean, Google Google, return, Google comes out today, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Exxon, Chevron. Like these are some of the monster companies that make up a good portion of our economy as far as their market cap. So it'll be interesting to see how their earnings do. Earnings have been pretty good in the last couple of months with companies. And really that's kind of been driven a lot by a lot of the layoffs. We've all probably seen that, right? Disney just announced that they're laying off another 7,000 people. And, you know, I think we all saw the Tucker Carlson's gone from uh, Fox News and the, the there's been a lot of shakeups in the multi, uh, you know, global media sector. Um, but as overall, I mean, just as the numbers, the S&P is up 6.7% this year. 
The NASDAQ, which got killed last year, as far as the tech stocks go, that's up 14%. Bonds are finally back. Bond index is up two and a half. Oil's actually down where it was up last year. Energy is down so far this year where it was up last year. So remember, that's typically what we see, right? A lot of people tend to run with what did the best, and it tends to obviously kind of go the other direction. So again, Stu and I would tell you we have no crystal ball. Right. I mean, the, the people on TV will tell you they do. But what you know, Stu and I would tell you that they're wrong every single time. Well, I mean, it, uh, you know, a broken clocks is wrong, wrong once a, or is right once a day. Right. So it's just about positioning yourself in the right places. So I think depending on your time frame, I, I would say and Stu would probably agree. We're just we're, we're in for more volatility throughout this year. It's going to go up and down. The Fed's now almost at five percent interest rates. Um, we got to see what earnings look like um, and really what, what the unemployment numbers come to. But that's that's really what we see. I would just plan for a bumpy ride this year. That's what most economists and, and specialists and um, you know people are planning on. But that's that's our take. Um, but again, it really just depends on what your personal situation is. And I think for a lot of people, they've heard us really emphasize this a lot in the past. And, and we obviously emphasize it with our clients as well. You know, staying the course is, is the most important thing that you can do, especially when there's volatility. If you're watching the podcast, you know, you're still working, you're still able to buy into the market, you're able to invest in your retirement plan at fixed points in time. You know, we've thrown around the term dollar cost averaging before that idea of being able to buy into the market at fixed points in time. So remember, you're buying into shares of these mutual funds, which hold these companies. And so when the market's down, you're getting more bang for your buck, you're buying at a discount. And that's what's appreciating more over time. You're buying more shares when the market's down. You're buying less shares when the market's up. And so the idea is, is that, you know, over a long period of time, uh, that's a great way to really work on your compounding and to really grow your assets that way. So, you know, regardless of what's going on, we love to see that the short-term bumps, things have headed in a positive direction, as Brian mentioned the last few months, but it, it's the important to stay invested. If you were thinking, hey, I need to get out, it's going to get worse, or maybe you made changes in uh, November, December. Again, you missed out on the bounce back now where, where we get closer to even. So um, a lot of volatility happening. I think one of the questions I'm getting asked a lot, it's less related to the Fed and, and interest rates, but more on the world reserve currency. I think there was some articles that were written uh, over the last you know couple of months about the US possibly not being the world reserve currency. And is it going to be, is it going to be China? Is it going to be Saudi Arabia coming up with a currency? Is it Russia? You know, what should what should people listen to there? Like, is that a realistic thing that's going to happen? And would that I mean, it would obviously affect us if that happened? But should people be thinking about that at this point? Brian, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's been a conversation for a while, right? Like the the debt ceiling conversation. I mean, I think the I think the United States is one of only two countries that has a debt ceiling like on their, you know, in their legislation, in their books. Um, and again, you could argue all day that, you know, the U.S. military is what, six, seven times bigger than the next three or four combined or whatever it is. So we're kind of like the big bully in the in the room, if you will. Um, so obviously, the U.S. dollar still remains the world currency. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, there's all the talking heads have an opinion. I, I think at this point where the, with the dollar and, and the power of the U.S., our GDP is still good as a country. I, th I think we're good there, but I think that that's also bled into why a lot of people, the question I get a lot is people worried about the banks. Like they've seen all this stuff with the banks. And they're like, hey, is, man, I've gotten half a dozen, well, at least half a dozen clients this just this week. And we're only in Tuesday about what to do with their banking or with their bank accounts. Um, but the first thing I would, and Stu and I would probably tell you is, you know, the U.S. dollar is still the currency. It's probably going that way for a while. But so as far as banks go and the banking system is revolving around that. I would just make sure you keep 250,000 or under in your banks. I mean, I wouldn't have any one account that has any more than 250. Remember the 250 FDIC insurance that you get is per title. So if you're married, you know, the each spouse could have one at 250, you could have a joint account at 250. So it's not just one bank, it's 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 based on the titling. Um, but I would certainly probably spread it out and I would certainly probably look at three things. I keep under 250. Number two, I would make sure the bulk of your liquid assets are in an account making at least over 4%. Um, SoFi Bank, uh, UFB Direct, MySavingsDirect.com. I mean, there's just a couple that I usually send clients to that I have personal accounts at myself. I mean, they're all they're all at four, four, four and a half plus rates. So if liquid. Um, so I, I talked to a client earlier. He had like, uh, like 400,000 in CDs. 
Uh, and again, so, you know, like, what's the rate on the CD? Well, he, he got it four or five months ago, and it was only like three and a half, and now he's kind of stuck in it. So CDs are technically a liquid. You can break them, but to just make sure you're doing that stuff with your banking. You're getting good rates. You're spreading out the dollars. But and again, if you, if you have a Bank of America account, a JP Morgan account, like you're good, right? Those are the two big to fail banks. But if you have a, a, a local bank, it may it may behoove you to have like another account somewhere. Heaven forbid the bank gets in trouble and they just freeze their assets, even though it's under the 250, you'll still get it. But that way you're not struggling to pay a bill or something if, if all all's in one place. So those are the three takeaways I would tell people from the banking stuff. But just like we saw with uh, SVB and Signature Bank, I don't know if you saw, but they got bailed out, you know, 100 cents on the dollar. So, um, you know, they're, the Fed is trying to, the, the government is trying to send a pretty big signal that we're going to, we're going to bail these guys out. But I would kick it back to Stu. I mean, obviously the banking is the one issue, but the other issue that's probably on everyone's forefront is just the rising interest rates and, and inflation and, and how that looks. I mean, Stu, what are you getting from clients in, in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this, you know, this segues nicely into the cash management conversation and, and you know, everybody's hopefully has an emergency fund. Hopefully you've got a, a little bit of money and just savings checking to really fund some of those daily expenses. And, you know, I think what we really try to do is, is break down where your money's at. You know, we've, you've heard us talk about in the past asset location. So the type of account that your money is, is held in. Um, as Brian alluded to, the best way to really think about this is, hey, you've got your short-term, uh, call your emergency savings or your rainy day fund. That might be those, those liquid type uh, accounts. That can be in something like a high yield savings account with a, with a SoFi or an American Express or Discover. Look for some of those online banks that are giving you, as Brian said, in that three to 4% range, and you can transfer money very easily in and out of your primary you know, financial institution. So uh, that's a no-brainer. Then you get into the um, products that might give you a little bit better interest rate, but might be locked up for a little a, a number of, of months or a period of time. So like your CDs, right? So if you're sitting in a, a one-year CD, for example, um, the rates right now are around 5%, maybe slightly over is, is what we're seeing, depending on the institution. The trade-off is for that better interest rate that you're locked in there for a year. And it's harder to break that and, and still be able to, uh, you know, keep that rate. You're going to be penalized for it in, in terms of the interest. It trades more like a, like a bond. So the value could actually be down. So you've got your short term, you, uh, your high yield savings, you go into your CDs, and then you could get into those fixed income type accounts, you know, your bond funds, um, investments that are tied more to the Fed and to interest rates, there's more of a constant dividend stream, depending on what area of, of debt you're buying, but there might be a little bit more volatility there. So thinking about that asset location, you know, splitting up your assets that maybe aren't in equity or they're not in stock, but being able to generate, you know, very easily four to 5% in this environment, I think is definitely a silver lining for, for what we're seeing for people that had cash. The market really did not reward savers for more than a decade, you know, coming out of 2007, 2008, and now with rates uh, obviously significantly higher, that rewards money, uh, rewards people with money in the bank. So I think that's a, that's a nice, attractive thing. Looks like we're getting some questions come in. This might be a good time to, uh, to maybe open it up to the group a little bit. Um, Brian, you want to take a couple of these? Yeah, so uh, I was just, uh, Christine, I, I think I had a great question about our W-4 and taxes. Stu and I would tell you, as, as, as financial planners, right, we've been doing this for, for 20 plus years, we we'll tell we'll be the first to tell you we never know where the market's going for sure. The people on TV certainly tend tend to want to tell you that, but things are there are things that are controllable, right? Go um, uh, taxes are one of those things, right? So being able to minimize your taxes. So Christine, email me on a personal basis or Stu, and we can set up a a, a call about what your particular particular tax situation is. But a lot of times people are missing freebies. Everyone here probably recently finished their taxes, um, hopefully, right? Or, or and or you're an extension at this point. Uh, you know, especially if you're doing TurboTax or Tax Slayer, one of the kind of these automated things, some, oftentimes you miss stuff or they just don't know about, you know, doing an IRA for the deduction or doing a dependent care FSA or, or doing your HSA or, uh, you know, other types of things you can do to lower your tax liability. Those are things that a good financial planner can help you mitigate as far as not, we, you know, none of us like paying taxes, I don't think. None of us would raise our hand on that. So there's ways to kind of get around that. So Christine, email me on that one. Um, I, there was a good question here about um, gold, silver, precious metals. I'll handle that. And I think there was a good first question. I'll kick back to Stu. Um, but last year, uh, again, the market, the stock market was down around 18%. So a lot of people think when the market's down, bonds are up. 
So last year that wasn't the case, right? Last year was it was the first year since the '60s. Bonds were also down. Bond the bond index was down around 15 percent, uh, but but commodities weren't much better. Gold was basically flat last year. I know what you're saying. It's a whole bunch better than down 18 percent, but it was. It's not like it was earning you anything either. So far this year, gold's up six percent. Silver's up. Uh, silver's up one percent. So to answer your question, uh, Debbie, commodities have their place. Commodities and real assets are typically very good to invest in in inflationary markets. The question is, how long is this inflation going to go? By the data, by the by the U.S. Census data, inflation is getting better over the last couple of months. I know when my wife and I go shopping, I have not seen that. <laughs> like we we we, we buy uh, you know we, we buy a lot, and we grill a lot at the house, and like the, we always, we're big fish eaters. And the price literally as of last Saturday went up another dollar for the things we normally buy. So the inflation says it's going down, but it's not going down in certain areas like housing, certain areas like um, like food. So that comes into it. But it's a great question. I, it's certainly a piece of the portfolio. I wouldn't I wouldn't not invest in it, but I would invest in it in the right way at the right percentage based on what your plan is. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we preach diversification. So it's not that inherently any of these these things are, are bad or good investments. It looks like there was a, a question higher up too about uh, digital banking, maybe uh, referring to crypto, cryptocurrency. Again, some of these things are just so new. People have assigned a value to it, certainly, and, and there's money to be made there, but you don't have all of your eggs in one basket. Um, none of these asset classes or investments, even these new ones are inherently bad. It's just understanding that there's risk there and you shouldn't be allocating uh, significant portions of your portfolio to something that could really change your financial situation in the event that something goes the wrong direction. So um, as, as an advisor, I, I think all advisors would be pretty much telling you the same thing there as far as diversification goes. Maybe to just um, tie back into the uh, the cash management conversation, I, I mentioned a couple of the different uh, account types that are out there. One that I, I didn't mention was American Express. So I think they've got a really great platform. I know a lot of people bank with, uh, with Amex or maybe have cards with them. They actually offer a high yield savings account uh, within American Express. So it's very easy to, to tie that into your primary banking institution and, and see it under some of the other uh, credit card logins. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure we get a list of, of a few of the ones. Certainly not making any recommendations here. Uh, there's hundreds of different uh, I, different account types out here for these high yield savings account, but we can certainly throw a, a couple in the in the chat yeah. that we see as being the most common. So. I, just threw, I just threw a couple that I personally use, have, have good experience with, I send clients to. Again, remember it's a game, right? So they're all trying to one-up each other, one-up each other. I know my SoFi bank, I just got an email this morning that they they up their rate. Um, so the Fed, I mean, the Fed's supposed to do one more increase, I believe next month, or, or at least that's their plan. We'll see if they do. Um but again, it's 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 really. I mean, we're literally up a thousand percent in interest rates. It's crazy to think about that. But a year and a half ago, we were at almost a half a percent. Now we're at five. So we we we've won a thousand percent increase in interest rates. So to the cash management portion, for those that are older on the call, typically in, in history, I mean, this is the highest interest rates we've had since twenty uh, two thousand and seven. That was a long time, obviously, right? But every time the Fed increases interest rates this quickly, if you just googled like a Fed. Uh, funds rate uh, chart. Normally, in the next year or two, it tends to fall off pretty quickly. It's a quick jump, and then it's a pretty, pretty quick, uh, you know, rundown on the back end. So, a lot of clients that are older, and and I'm seeing this a lot from our 55, 65 ish plus clients, are Brian. I, I like these rates, the, these you know five plus percent rates that I can get. But I understand if I go and I put it in a checking account at five percent it may not be there in six months, right? It may not be there in two years because it's going to fall off and then it, it, it's going to come down. I'd like to lock that in. So a lot, you see that more and more, Stu mentioned with like long-term CDs, um, you know, uh, annuity products and insurance companies. I know I've written a couple that are north of five, five and a half percent for 10 year locks. So that, you know, for a retiree that wants to just get that and guarantee that rate for a long time and collect that income, um, you're seeing that more and more. Uh, but we've literally shifted in the last year and a half from a refinance world into a you know cash management world, right? Like, but uh, you, you guys have probably seen mortgage companies. We have a lot of them as clients. They've dismantled a lot of them. They've they've bankrupted that side of the business. I mean, mortgage rates today are a thirty year is about six point six percent. Fifteen years about six percent, and home values haven't really changed. So the the amount of loans for new homes and new home sales has really really gone down. So a lot of people are just kind of stacking their cash at these rates and, and trying to get some more benefits for it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a nice segue into the, you know, the real estate market. That's always an area where we get a lot of questions, you know, is, is now a great time to buy a house? You know, should I be should I be moving right now? The market has really slowed down because a lot of folks refinanced or they bought within the last, you know, two, three years at very low interest rates. And so why would you move or upgrade your house or, or you know, switch locations and then uh, reborrow that money essentially that you just taken out a couple of years ago via a loan, and then pay you know two or three times the rate that you got a couple of years ago to borrow the same dollars on a new property, if that makes sense. So that's really slowed some things down in the real estate market. I think that's a trend that's that's probably going to continue at least while rates are this high, and you know we'll see what happens as, as far as rates maybe coming down a little bit. But you know that affordability I, I think is really going to be an issue because of how expensive it becomes to finance these loans. It just really slows things down. So, I mean, remains to be seen um, in terms of how it impacts things, but I think you're going to see as the economy slows down, as, as some of these layoffs work their way through it, you know, tech sector, a lot of organizations that grew very quickly in the low interest rate environment are now going to have to contract to some extent uh, as they're not able to finance their, uh, their growth as cheaply. And so some of those things could create more housing availability in the future, hopefully lower some of the prices uh, that we see on some of these homes that have really been run up in the last uh, couple of years. So interesting. That was a good question. So for, anyway, I was just trying to run back up the questions here. Denise was asking rule of thumb for pre-tax versus Roth in a 401k deduction. That's a great question. Uh, you may want to reach out to to Stuart or myself. It just really depends on what your age, you know, really age and income are the two main determining factors, but we got to pay Uncle Sam his taxes. Roth is paid now. Pre-tax is paid on the back end when you take it out. So for younger folks, you tend to see more Roth for 50, you know, 45 plus folks tend to be more pre-tax in the middle of those ages. Sometimes you do both, but really depends on income and ages. So reach out to us and we can go over your particular particular financial situation to help you there. Um, Jenny asked top three accounts someone should have to help build wealth. Um, that's a loaded question. Uh, certainly kind of your freebies, right? Or, you know, do the employer sponsored retirement plan if you have one. Certainly take advantage of any matching dollars. Um, Roth IRAs are great if you're in an income or, or you're able to do a backdoor Roth and, and put that together. Um, but Roth, Roth accounts and your employer-sponsored plan, those are probably your best accounts. And then for your taxable money, again, the, these high interest paying FDIC insured online banks are probably your, your other best option for your non-qualified accounts as long as you need it to be liquid. Yeah, I, I, another good question from James. Uh, James, I, I think it's definitely worth reaching out and, and, and maybe shooting us a, an email. But, you know, what do you do when you've maybe seen some losses in certain accounts? Is it a good time to rebalance? Is it a good time to, to maybe stay in now that you've taken the loss? I think for a lot of clients, you know, as, as Brian mentioned earlier with certain asset classes, a lot of times the best time to stay in them or get into them is after they've had a, a really bad year. Um, that's usually when things can turn around. Not always the case, certainly in, in certain areas, but um, taking a little bit more of that contrarian approach or the value play can be pretty impactful. If you've been in a lot of tech stocks or more growth-oriented investments, and you've seen that you know 15 to 18% drop, uh, hopefully it's come back a, a little again in, in the last few months, but probably not the best time to be rotating out of that because maybe a, a lot of those losses are in. Or if you're thinking, hey, maybe I, I don't want to have uh, as much exposure to these investments. How do you do it in a, a strategic way? Rebalance your accounts. So you're not taking the losses all at once. Uh, you know, tax considerations to maybe think about as well. If it's a, if it's a brokerage or an after-tax type account, taking some uh, we call tax loss harvesting. You know, there's ways to take advantage of the tax situation there and, and get into other investments. So it's a a bit of a nuanced conversation, but you know, those are the things you want to think about when it comes to rebalancing a portfolio when the market's down. Uh, do you want to do you want to take those losses? How are you doing in a strategic way? And um, you know, ultimately, does it keep you on track for your long term goal, which is uh, to grow your to grow your net worth? So uh, interesting all the way around. I think we've have we caught up with uh, all the questions at this point. It looks like there's one about uh, pent up demand for new buyers. I mean, I I think there's going to continue to be pent up demand for for uh, people to buy a home. Like it's the American dream, right? People want to buy homes. As people move out, they they grow. The population continues to grow. We just haven't seen the inventory be able to keep up. And the reality is, I, I think there'll be continued demand for homes for the time being. So again, part of the reason the prices are staying high, even though uh, rates are going up as well. An interesting thing I heard, Brian, I don't know if you heard this as well, but there's a lot of uh, turnover in the commercial real estate sector. So that's an area we don't talk about as much, but a lot of these corporate leases, these big buildings, big cities, 
when yeah. everyone went into this work from home environment, a lot of these corporations are not renewing or are planning on not renewing their giant lease spaces in these big cities. So one of the things that's being talked about is, you know, how do these massive corporate uh, centers, do they reconvert into more uh, residential type communities? Do we, do we retrofit an office building as a apartment or condo complex? So that's something that I think we're going to see more of, especially in certain highly populated areas. That's just, it was interesting to me. Because that's, again, think about, I mean, the value of any building, right? Like it, like it obviously depends if it's in Kansas or the, the, you know, middle of Manhattan, right? But I mean, you're talking tens to hundreds of millions of dollars per building. And most buildings are not paid for. They're paid for by, you know, typically like a real estate investment trust or something. But then there's a big loan to, to a bank. So, I mean, that's the other thing with the banking issues is as these, Again, you, when you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank owns you, right? The, the, the old the old cliche, but if you if the if you owe the bank a billion dollars, you own the bank, right? Because they can't go out of business; they need your payments. So the the the, the irony of the the situation is if if the banks were to call all their loans um, and and have them all paid off right now, they would still be in the red because they they they, they, they lend out more than they have. So that's really the other concern with the banks, and that's why I'd be very careful about you know, making sure you're, you're using that FDIC insurance and stuff with the banks. But yeah, commercial real estate is interesting. We have a lot of commercial real estate clients and uh, they are not doing well by, by the numbers because uh, they're just, the, the tenants are not renewing. There's, you can just Google the articles, uh, you know, all these big law firms in New York City. I'm just picking New York City as an example because their real estate's like, you know, supposedly the prime of the prime, right? In, in Manhattan. But a lot of these big law firms, all these big financial institutions are moving out of like the crazy expensive area of Manhattan into lower areas with, with, with less space because of all this stuff. So commercial real estate is probably going to continue to have a tough time. The question is, is that going to translate to a lot of these banks that are holding the loans having a tough time? But it's certainly going to impact like the real estate investment trusts and um, you know the mutual, fund, the mutual funds that are invested in real estate. So it'll be interesting to watch to, to Stu's point. We'll have to see how that plays out. Um, good, really good question from uh, Felipe. You know, as far as buying an investment property, I know this probably pertains to a lot of people. I, I like uh, investing in real estate myself. I know, you know, Brian, you've got a, a property as well that you rent out. You know, is it a good time to buy now at a higher interest rate and refinance later? Or mm -hmm. do you hold off until rates hopefully go lower, but then prices go up? And so that's kind of an interesting, you know, thing to think about. From a tax standpoint, you're obviously better off buying at a lower price point because that's where taxes are based. I, I think in every state is this the sales price. You're kind of pegged in at a lower price. If we could time the market perfectly, you know, I think it would be it would be an easy conversation. Hey, you'd, you'd probably buy at a lower price point and you'd hope that uh, the rates go down in the short term. Um, I, to be honest, haven't seen a lot of scenarios where, you know, in the past you could have put a 20% down payment uh, down on a on a rental property, got in with a good rate, and, and made the property cash flow. I think with rates where they're at now, you'd be hard pressed to find any type of a deal out there where you could put, you know, 20%, you know, being kind of a historical number, you could put in with rates where they're at and still make it cash flow based on what rental rates are in that area. You'd have to put down 40, 50 percent uh, in some scenarios with uh, with where loans are at. So it's really you know, did the numbers pencil? And I think for a lot of people, um, and we're seeing this, there's a lot more, uh, a, a lot more people that are holding off on taking a loan out for a property because of where rates are at and, and hoping the prices come down. So I, I think yeah, that's I think the big, to Stu's point, I mean, I'm always looking for round properties myself that makes sense. I know Stu is, the price point's really everything. So whether you're paying 4%, you know, a, a year and a half ago for an investment property, 30 year fixed, or you're paying maybe north of seven now, uh, for an investment property, the the price matters, right? Because when you buy into that, when you buy into that property, if you if if the value of the home goes down, all of a sudden the bank's going to try to call your loan if you don't have at least twenty percent in there, and then that's gonna that's gonna be a mess. So it's it's really about location and the cash flow that's going to be there. Um, again, if you buy, if you do like, I mean, hell, the way with the way the uh, the curve is inverted right now. I mean, a five-year arm, I was just looking it up to see, but a five-year arm, like a lot of people are like, well, I'll just do an arm that, to get a lower rate. And then, you know, in five years, I'll either sell the property or hopefully rates have, are down by then. And I'll just go to a 15 or 30 then. But the five-year arm is basically the same as a 30-year fixed. I mean, that, that should, that's so that the arms really aren't helpful either. 
Um, so it's really just about waiting for it. But I would say if you're in the real, real estate market, it's always just about finding a, a, a good deal. But you certainly have more leverage to buy than you did a year and a half ago, right? Like there's the, before there was 50 offers and you probably, you know, I had clients that put in 30 offers a home, you know, or 30 offers would go in before the actual seller picked one. Now you have a little bit more leverage from the, from the buying side, but certainly a good asset because it is very tax efficient, right? So if you're, you know, it's all tax free income, you know, offset by the, the cost of the property. So a uh, great question. Um, we got another question here as far as a good time to invest in land, hold or sell it later. Um, that really depends on, on a lot of factors, right? Where, where the land is. It's like, any, it's like buying any real estate, right? You're hoping the, uh, the area either blows up, uh, you know, you get some commercial stuff in there. You, you, people want to want to visit there. Uh, so it really depends on where the land is, obviously. I don't know, like, Stu, what are your thoughts on, on I that? I mean, yeah, it's it's location definitely. It was funny. I was uh, I was at an eye appointment. My, my getting my contacts renewed uh, a month or so ago, and my optometrist was telling me this story about uh, somebody he knew that had uh, had gotten pretty wealthy buying just raw land. They were a kind of a farming type family, and they had owned property, uh, you know, agriculturally in the greater Phoenix area. Obviously, an area that's that's really grown outward big time in the last 10, 15 years. And it was funny because you know, 30 years ago, they started what they thought was pretty far out of downtown. And then the developers would come knocking and they would sell their property and they would buy land and, and set up shop a couple miles further outside of kind of the ring. If you want to think about bands of, of how a, a community expands. And then, you know, five, 10 years later, they would sell that land, make a profit. And then they would, they would set up shop a little bit further out. So moral of the story is, yeah, the location is really important. You know, is there development happening in the area or do you think or, and are, are willing to gamble and take the risk that there will be development happening at some point in the future. So yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's definitely case by case, but kind of a- I, a I got a good client, like actually that made me think of a good client of mine down in Florida. He owns a construction company, so he builds homes. So he has that skill, right? So he doesn't, like, a lot of us, when we look for homes, we're looking for the bedroom and bath numbers and how the accents look and how, you know, we're that's what we as buyers want to go that aren't in the construction business Anyone who has construction ties, especially like, like the client I'm thinking of, he only buys land. He's like, I just care. I mean, and, and he'll 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 even buy land. Or he'll even buy a house that's in a good spot where the house is a disaster because he'll just tear it down. He'll, he cares only about the land because that's even more valuable to him than the house is. Um, so if you're in the real estate market or you know builders, like certainly if you have that arm as well. I'd almost always go with the land because you can, you know, always fix up or flip or, you know, build a house on it at that point. It's just about the the quality of the land that you're you're choosing. No, that's a, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, I know we wanted to talk about insurance, Brian. I, I think, you know, this is something we've gotten a lot of questions on. I, I want to say it's probably one of the most misunderstood parts of the financial services industry. I, I think it gets a bad rap. There's a lot of people that just peddle insurance as a as a way to generate commission. And, and you know, there's it's kind of a, a, a dirty word, right? Especially when you start talking about annuities some of the time, but we get a lot of questions on it. You know, should people be thinking about insurance products as a way to, you know, create an estate or build wealth? When is it appropriate? When is it not appropriate? And is right now a good time to maybe be thinking about um, some of these products that are out there, especially since there's a yeah. lot of volatility. So um, I know this is your, uh, something you're passionate about. So I'll, I'll kind of let you uh, drill into this a little bit. Yeah, well, so the insurance world, right? So remember, an insurance company's job is to get your money out, out of their, out of your pocket into theirs by offering you a competitive product with a contract of some type, right? So it's a life insurance or disability insurance or long-term care insurance or an annuity product, which is basically all an annuity is an, is an investment with some type of insurance for something, whether it be guaranteed lifetime income or no market volatility or a buffer to market volatility. Um, but all these insurance products, if you will, um, are really uh, as advantageous as interest rates are. So fast forward a year and a half ago, um, in 2022, there was $310 billion put into annuities. That was an all-time record back, the record before that was like 290 billion in uh, 2008. So, and but the reason why, and again, I would tell you, our office probably didn't write a lot of annuities before last year for like the previous three, four years, they were kind of one-offs in, in, in situations where they made sense for clients. But you're seeing to those numbers, right? You're seeing a lot lot more because the, the benefits are better. Um, like take, for example, 
like most people didn't have a 401k. So I always ask people, how do you plan to withdraw it when you retire? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I've read online, I can take a 4% withdrawal rate and I shouldn't run out of money. Okay, oh, if, if possibly depending on how you structure it. But even if you do run out of money, that's it. Do, do you want some guarantees on it at that point to not have any market volatility and or to have lifetime income? Um, and a lot of people want to have at least some portion to supplement social security that's going to be there for their whole life. But the eight, so these, these, these annuities that give lifetime income bans, they used to be around four or 5% two, three years ago and interest rates were nothing. Now you can get a, a, guaranteed in, a guaranteed withdrawal base sometimes at around age 65. I know I wrote one the other day at like 7% lifetime guaranteed income off of, off of the amount you put in. Like that's a really high withdrawal rate. If you came to Stuart and I and said, hey, I got a million dollars, give me 7% a year guaranteed that I can't outlive. We can't, there's nothing like beyond putting you in an insurance product like that, which do exist right now, there's nothing we could do. So you're Brian, saying- Brian, could I, could I jump in for a second? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of people that we talk to, they may think they have a higher risk tolerance in terms of what they're comfortable investing in than they realize. And a lot of times we see there's this, there's this cliff that happens and, and a lot of it's emotional and, and mental that you're maybe comfortable taking on risk and maybe you were getting that seven, eight percent in your account in your 50s and early 60s. But when you retire and you're not working anymore, there's a tendency to de-risk and almost swing the opposite direction. And, and more often than not, people are really so focused on preservation. To Brian's point, there's no way you're getting seven to eight percent in a in a conservative portfolio. We can't guarantee that anyway. And, and when you're focused on the preservation side. So keep that in mind if you're someone who's maybe getting close to retirement or you're thinking about lifetime income. Because that's really what it's about. It's it's the goals based side of this that says, hey, are you going to have enough money to live on into your 80s and 90s? There's no risk of you outliving it. That's a bigger risk than running out of money uh, in your 60s or 70s if you've got a 401k. So uh, as far that. as annuities go, annuities typically aren't suitable. Maybe in 99% of people that are under age 55, like they're they're people. I mean. I'm almost 40. Like I really, most people don't have any business having them until you get to the age where you need some of those protections. But that's why in 2008, that's why 2022, you see such an influx uh, into these products because a lot of the retirees want to insure and put some guarantees on, on those dollars. Um, Christine just asked a good question about long-term care insurance. I know I was talking about annuities for a little while, but with the higher interest rates, when they get, when the company gets your money, the insurance company, they're handing you a contract they have to put X amount of that money in bonds. The reason these, these contracts are much more beneficial is because you can, they can get bonds now paying north of 5%. So they're able to give you better guarantees than contracts. I, I have annuity contracts for clients that we're literally stopping. We're, we're getting out of them and going to the newer, better ones with higher rates. So to Christine's point on long-term care, it's the same thing. It's not just annuities, it's life insurance, it's long-term care like a, a good care, again, I'm not here to mention any product names, but a good care just dropped their long-term care premium by 20%. Again, same idea, because they can get your money and they can, they can, they can go buy bonds at higher interest rates. So to answer the question though, um, you know, the best time to get long-term care is typically around uh, 50 to 60, 55 is kind of the, the, the sweet spot. After that, it gets really, really expensive. Before that, it's, unless you have some family history on some things, it's, it's kind of pr cost prohibitive. Um, but you're seeing, whereas long-term care insurance, we actually stopped writing it for a while because uh, it was so expensive and we were doing estate planning and, and asset protection trusts. But you're, well, I had three clients apply for long-term care in the last three weeks just because rates have dropped. So if you're in the insurance market for anything, life insurance, long-term care, some kind of a protection annuity insurance product, now is a very good time to look at those. Yeah, and I, I think... Doing it when the market's up is definitely more advantageous than when the market's down or after a really bad year. So it's one of those things where maybe you've been kicking the tires on it for a while. Maybe you were in a lot of, uh, of equity. Maybe you uh, have seen your account come back a little bit in the last few months. Might be time to revisit it if it was something you were waiting on uh, to really pull the trigger on sometime last year after the account dropped. So you want to annuitize when the value of your account is, is high. Um, I don't want to get into the, the market timing element too much because obviously that, that could happen at, at any point. But when the market's up, typically a better time to annuitize and kind of put that base in and then get the uh, the income guarantees on, on top of that. So, right. And one thing I would say is a lot of people think annuity is a red letter word because they're giving their money to an insurance company and then they no longer have access to it. That's, that's like 1% of annuities now. Most of them, 
you don't annuitize. Annuitize means you give up control of your money and you don't have access to it anymore. Most of the way the products work now is you still have access to your money. You're just getting some type of insurance benefit for it, whether it be lifetime income or whatever. If the money ever runs out, then it annuitizes. And you know, if it's an income stream, they, they continue to pay you like social security. Um, they just work a little bit different. Um, Christine asked a good question on reverse mortgages. Uh, in the past, they were a red letter word too. Uh, they really were a red letter product probably five, seven years ago, whatever it was before they became regulated. Um, you know, you have all seen the commercials that every, I mean, a couple of years ago, every other commercial was kind of a reverse mortgage sale. It's almost like now every other commercial is pharmaceutical, right? But now that they are um, federally regulated, um, you know, it's basically a way to reverse amortize your house. So instead of like paying a mortgage, you're getting paid a mortgage. Um, so typically it's a last resort. No, that's, it's not normally a place you start with retirement income. Um, but in, in the past, you would do these, these really bad products that weren't insured and you could get kicked out of your house in your, in your later years. Like now that they're covered, that, that can't happen. Um, so we have some clients doing them, especially our, our, older, our older clientele that didn't plan on inflation it being as bad as it has been. Um, we've tapped it, but uh, it's a option and certainly a better one than it was four or five years ago. I can tell you that much. So we, you see it more so now than you did in the past. This is a, a really good question from Rachel. I, I think we're, we're seeing this question a lot. You know, maybe you've got a, a paid off property and you're nearing retirement and, and there's an opportunity to make a decision of whether you keep that property and, and maybe rent it out versus sell the property and then, um, you know, invest that money elsewhere. So I, I would encourage people that are in this situation to really look at it uh, from a tax standpoint and from a cost standpoint. So when you sell real estate, you, know, you got to think about what you're what you're paying in terms of a, of a realtor, right? So four to five percent is, is pretty standard that you're going to give up right off the top based on the sales price for uh, for the real estate side of things. You're going to create a tax situation. So you know based on when you bought uh, and then when you're selling it, there's capital gains to think about, especially if you weren't living there for two of the last five years and and, and maybe it's not your primary residence, which I think is the case with a lot of people. So when you factor in taxes on the transaction, uh, and then the real estate side of uh, the, the realtor fees, it can be pretty expensive to sell your house. And then after you've settled up with the IRS, the real estate agents, then you're taking, you know, the, the leftover money and you're investing it and then trying to generate, obviously, a, a return on, on that principal. I think the other thing to think about and, and where I encourage a lot of people to consider maybe renting out a property is you have so much equity in the home and your expenses are so low if your mortgage is paid off. In a lot of cases, you can afford to pay a property manager. I think in almost every uh, sense of the word, you have enough cash flow to let somebody else completely handle it. So depending on where you're living, what the rental market looks like, uh, you, you, I won't even get into all of the tax uh, write-offs and things that you can take on a, on a rental property. You know, the repairs that you're making, all of the expenses that go into it, you're writing that all off of the income you're making. So it can really create um, a, a pretty nice, nest egg for yourself and it creates cash flow especially in retirement so for a lot of people that i work with that have a property and they're thinking about selling versus renting out i tend to uh encourage people to go the uh the renting out you know the direction just when you think about all of the fees and the, and the taxes that are baked in the other route yeah cash flow is everything right like yep. in, in, as far as rental property to stew's point on the taxation it's normally tax-free income right A after you deduct all your expenses so I would say if you have, a, and there's, there's obviously some other variables here, but if you have a rental property that's, that's netting you a positive return from your expenses, and it's probably all basically tax-free from expenses, and it's in a good area, you don't think it's going to go to hell in a handbasket for whatever reason, you're probably better off, at least in this market, to probably hold it. Um, it's, just, it's just a great asset to have. Anything else you do and you sell and you put it in, you're going you're gonna to be subject to taxation. Rental real estate income, as long as there's expenses there, is one of the few ways you can get tax, a tax-free income stream. Yeah, no, really, really good question. Let's um, talk a little bit about 401k planning. So I think this is this is relevant to everybody in retirement planning. What should people be thinking about right now? How do you position your retirement plan for the next several years? I mean, I'll, I'll kind of start. I, I know we've probably got some people that are in different phases of retirement planning, uh, whether you're in the beginning of your career I think the uh, we, the messaging that we like to tell people is, hey, look, stay aggressive. You know, when the market's down, that's the best time to be contributing. So if you're a younger employer in the middle stages of your career, continue to be aggressive, stay the course, look at these as buying opportunities. You're buying these investments at a, at a discount, like I talked about earlier. 
If you're someone who's maybe closer to retirement or heading into retirement, and it's on the horizon within the next five to 10 years, hopefully you were already a, a bit more conservative if, if that's where your risk tolerance was. Maybe you were in more of a, a moderate uh, risk profile, so you were not seeing as much volatility just over the last uh, couple of years. The other thing that that you know we've proposed to some clients, and it's kind of a, I don't want to call it a risk-free way, but it's a nice way to capture some of the volatility, is if you're someone who's closer to retirement, maybe you're in a more conservative portfolio in general, one thing you can do is just keep all of the new money that's going into your account every couple of weeks very, very aggressive because you have nothing to lose. So in other words, you're, you know, you've got your nest egg, right, that you've saved for over the past several decades. Maybe you're a little more moderate risk with it. You're hedging your bets, so to speak. But you can have that current balance separate from where the future money is going. So every two weeks, just keep that, that you know, retirement plan contribution really aggressive and then rebalance it later. Uh, when you get closer, rebalance it into something that's uh, a little bit more based on your long-term risk profile. So it's a nice way to take advantage of what's happening in the market. Um, just a, a fun little tidbit. Brian, I don't know if you've got anything you want to add. Yeah, I mean, the blanket thing I always say is if you're 10, 15 years away from using the money, all stocks all the time, close your eyes and put in as much as you can up to the limits. Like pr pretty, pretty simple. Uh, diversified over various equity portions, small, mid, large cap, international, whatever you want to do. No one's got a, no one's got a crystal ball. But it, the, the, the rubber meets the road when you get within that five, 10 year mark um, where you can't afford to recover a big loss. Again, that's why you're seeing, you know, 300 billion go into annuities last year because a lot of baby boomers want to put that protections on those monies. Um, but like diversification is everything. So once you get to the point where you need to use money, why diversification matters so much is, you know, so, I mean, uh, this is a good point I would bring up that clients always bring to me. I had a, I had a client review last week and he's like, Brian, aren't you guys supposed to be adjusting my account. That's why I'm paying you to manage my money. The market was down last year. Why did I lose money? I thought you're supposed to know that and get out of it. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what a good investment manager does. We're going to go over what the market did last year and what your account did. So we can see there's some value there, right? We didn't lose the full amount of the market, but we're also making sure you don't make irrational decisions and sell it. That's what a lot of people, behavioral finance costs a lot of people. Um, so it's not a loss until you sell it, meaning if you retired last year and you needed money last year, and let's say you had all your money in, well, let's say you had a third of your money in stocks, third in bonds, and a third in, say, gold or a commodities fund. Well, the first two were down. Commodities was basically flat. So if you did some good diversification last year, you say you needed X amount from your retirement account. You, it's nice that you would have structured it that way and you would have taken from the commodities. You see what I'm saying? Because you're pulling from something that's not down on paper. So it's all about planning it properly, because if you retire or, and you go to close an investment out and you're selling it while it's down, that loss does then become real. That's that's the thing where people really hurt themselves is how and when they sell uh, the losses. So to Stu's point earlier, if you're in a non-qualified account for tax harvesting, which we do a lot, that makes sense. But you just want to be really cognizant of that. Um and again, through, I think the volatility will continue this year. So I would I certainly keep you know adding into the account, make sure you're giving every payroll. It's going to go up and down, up and down. I think that's pretty, it's going to be pretty consistent. One other thing I would take away, I know we're getting up on time here, is estate planning. I would just throw out this tidbit as well. A lot of people don't do this um, or they, you know, no one likes to think about their morbidity, uh, you know, wills, powers of attorney, trust work, medical directives, et cetera. Um, I do a lot of that work. I, I know Stu does too. Uh, throughout the COVID years, right, the, the the courts were closed. The courts were really closed for months at a time, sometime a year year plus at a time. So, like, I had I just had a client pass in uh in Florida, or a friend of a client rather, and it took them six months just to get a death certificate. It's going to take another three years probably to close the estate with how backed up the courts are. And again, not to talk about things that we don't like to talk about, but you know, if anything were to happen, like you want to make sure you you knock that stuff out too. Wills, powers of attorney, spend a grand, a couple hundred dollars, whatever it is, just to kind of get that stuff in line. Because without it, you're you're really putting your loved ones and your heirs at a at, in a tough spot um, without having those documents. Because the court system and the probates of all the states, let alone Florida, because it's a retirement state, it's really really bad out there. So make sure you, if you haven't done that, it's very important to make sure you've done it and or get it updated. But it's and it's so easy to do because remember retirement plan accounts. They uh, they supersede the the will, so you can just put a name beneficiary on these accounts and make sure that uh, this is going to a loved one. I mean, that's right. the thing I th I don't think a lot of people realize. No, make sure you're always checking your beneficiaries. If you get divorced, check your beneficiaries. I've seen that in 20 years where 
they never changed it and uh, legally it's still theirs. But, uh, you know, yeah, to answer like the little trust help, um, to, to Stu's point, life insurance, IRAs, uh, bank accounts, POD designations, you can put all these on there and they'll go around probate. But things like your house, your cars, um, belongings, um, you know, th- you know, non-qualified accounts, if you didn't, if you didn't title them properly, um, things like that will go to probate. And it's taking two, three years, depending on the state. Florida's probably more than that now. Um, mm-hmm. So by making a trust and titling assets into the trust, like your house and such, that goes by contract around probate. So again, a lot of times people advisors don't talk about this stuff. It's extremely important. Um, and nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to think about it. Nobody wants to go through and do the medical directives. I want to do this if this happens. Don't do this to me if this happens. They're tough for conversations, but they're real world things that, you know, it's the reality of our, our of humanity, right? So make sure you're doing that just because it's, I, I've have a few clients going through probate. Thankfully, their stuff's in order, but I've been referred to some to help estates that didn't do it. And it's already after the fact. And it's, it's just, it's just very long, messy delay processes. Yeah, we don't we don't want to end on a on a down yeah. note, but you know, obviously it's a, <laughs> it's something we want people to think about. Um, obviously, you wouldn't have to deal with it, but your loved ones would, and it's it's your money, and it's uh, it's important. You've worked hard for it. It should go to the people that you care about. And so, at the end of the day, that's that's why we encourage this. Um, Brian, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up the show here today? Yeah, again, I think I thank everyone's for your time. You know, I always you know the cliche. It's always the most valuable asset is our time, right? We really appreciate you guys joining. We look forward to seeing you next quarter. Uh, you know, I think an, uh, an invite, uh, a follow up email will go out. But by all means, we like feedback, right? That these are these meetings are for you. We want to make sure you guys are grabbing good information. Hopefully, that can go back to help your financial situation. You can always reach out to Stu or I anytime in between the meetings, not just after these. Um, but I just, I thank you for your time and we're here to help you whenever you need it. No, sounds great. We'll see everybody uh, next quarter. Thanks for again for attending and uh, keep an eye out as well for well sent emails, more great content that comes through from your employer. And again, you, uh, you may see us uh, in the near future. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye.